like some random that. person on this TikTok is, did. <laughs> this has nothing to do with this week's topic. But if if you take away anything from this episode, it's you should watch Bluey. <laughs> I don't know if that's the takeaway, <laughs> but I think they should take away where to find this podcast. There you go. You can find this podcast everywhere that you can find podcasts, you know, under a rock, in a sock, under your bed, in your head. You can also find it on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube, which you should also consider liking, commenting, and subscribing to this YouTube channel because it does support us. And um, I mean, how else am I going to be able to afford Disney Plus so that I can watch more Bluey? So, and, uh, I mean, <laughs> that that's that's cool, but it also helps defeat the evil algorithm overlords. I mean, that too, if you wanted to get technical, yeah. but is this even usable? <laughs> uh, I'm going to cobble this together and it's going to be great. Oh we're we're just out here vibing. We're having we're having fun. It's just texture. It's texture. Yeah. 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 Texture it's for the texture. episode. Texture for the episode. So uh, this week's topic is one that I thought would be kind of interesting because we're both kind of going through this right now. Uh, and that mm. is uh, how to edit your decks. Because it's either something you think way too much about or it's something that we don't think enough about. So I think it's uh, relevant and interesting to talk about. I'm kind of glad that you brought this up specifically because I think it was at 2.30 in the morning I sent you a message being like, Hey, um, can you give me your opinion on how to change Zavandrel? Because I was like, I need this. It's the magic player equivalent of uh, texting you up. <laughs> can you look at my deck list, bro? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know it's 2.30, but can you give, give it a little look-see, please? I would really appreciate it. So this kind of begs the question, um, why would you edit your decks? Like... Isn't a deck just like done when you finish building it? Is it ever finished? Like it just opens up this whole big can of worms. And I think that's why a lot of people don't approach it. Yeah. And I used to think, I used to think that decks are finished. And I, I don't think that anymore, but I think that's just come with time. You know, I think we're on like year two for mm-hmm. me. I was like, yeah, deck's done. But like every now and then a set will will drop that kind of gives you something new and exciting that, you know, could go into it. So like, I think there's always a possibility for a deck to change. Like for instance, like my Locust God deck, I thought it was done. Even now I still think it's kind of done. But like Oviga just got previewed, not even previewed, released. Time is weird. But I'm like, I kind of think Oviga would be kind of good in here because it's like a pseudo second locust god almost that Mm -hmm. i kind of appreciate i'm guilty of like editing the decks that i really 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 care about and then those decks that are like kind of on the fence and like kind of maybe gonna get taken apart at some point Mm -hmm. if i start editing them then i'm gonna start liking this deck (laughs) and i'm looking for a reason to not like it like this is like a super messy breakup or just like that clingy x And I think for me, editing decks is kind of like that, where I just get emotionally reinvested in something that I don't want to get emotionally reinvested into. So I'll like maybe change a card just to like toss my bone. But that's it, really. Like once a once a deck that I don't actively feel extremely invested into is done, that deck is like a time capsule of my deck brewing at the time. I, I weirdly feel that way with my Alibu deck because I like the deck, but like I don't reach for it often, but I feel like there are good pieces that are constantly being released for it. Mm-hmm. And even then I just got that new WPN, you know, exclusive secret lair that you could buy at your card shop. And it came with an Ugin the Ineffable, which I actually run in that deck. And I'm like, ooh, I could put in this prettier version of it. But then I'm like, if I put in this prettier version, that means I'm going to be reinvested in it because I'm going to want to see the pretty version again. And I kind of feel weird about this deck, but I like it, but I don't. And it's kind of like this weird. I don't like the I don't like the terminology used, but it is kind of like a weird. Like I shouldn't text him. I shouldn't text him. Yeah. Oh crap! It's I exactly texted him at three a.m. <laughs> yeah. It I- is like you up. <laughs> For me, editing a deck is the continuation of something I really enjoy. Kind of like you said, like you want to invest your time and energy into seeing it Mm -hmm. grow and change. But also editing a deck because maybe things didn't work out for you or maybe it, it worked one way in your head, but it didn't translate that exact same way physically. Or maybe you just didn't like 
the um the concept that you went with or maybe it worked too well and you're like oh my god i need to kind of take my foot off the gas a little bit Mm -hmm. let's let's slow my roll here there's a lot of ways and reasons as to edit your decks we can tie this back into last week's episode with the with the good stuff dilemma um I, i was talking to someone this week and they're like I really want to switch up my Tiamat deck because like it just feel like it's too consistent. I'm like, yeah, because you have a seven mana tutor five dragons into your hand in mm-hmm. the command zone. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, what dragon are you tutoring for every single time? And he's like, oh, you know, like this or that. And I was like, build that as the commander instead. Yeah. If you just if you find yourself doing a particular thing often enough, curb your deck. Make mm-hmm. make the changes to the vibe to match the vibe that you're going for anyways. You're literally cutting out the middleman in that situation. Exactly. I feel like that's a big thing that I do when I am actually making changes is I'm getting back to the roots of my original concept or I'm getting back to the roots Mm -hmm. of that thing that I wanted to do in the first place. Yeah. And whether that's, you know, things got too busy, things got too convoluted like you said that was too powerful Mm -hmm. sometimes i'll even have to make changes because i wanted the deck to be more powerful and it wasn't powerful enough yeah i mean i have two examples of that myself like remember when we talked about my sissy deck how i took Mm -hmm. out that elspeth because it gave sissy that unnatural bump to allow me to tutor things for like a chroma angel of wrath or um gisella which was obscene um, and it just kind of made the deck too easy for me to play, but it also made me feel like I, it, it was unplayable for my opponents to play against. Like it just felt unfair, mm-hmm. but like on the other hand, you have my Zapandril deck, which we talked about in last week's mono green episode. What anyway, um, <laughs> where the deck just feels sluggish. It feels slow and kind of lethargic and, I need to get a little bit more gas on the fire here. So I'm actually currently in the process of trying to um, make that a little bit better for my needs. And and by currently in the process, they mean like literally 10 minutes before we started recording. They had <laughs> well, cards sprawled on their desk. Yeah. Three. Right I wanted to get it. We were talking about it. It felt like a good time. And then I can yeah. reference the cards as we talk. It's like visual. It's true. It's true. That deck of yours is is an example of like wanting to go nuclear from the get go, realizing, oh no, this is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. I I like it, but it's not the vibe that I'm going for. So you it necessitates changes. It it does Um, because you I I texted you specifically and I was like, how can I make this better? Because like you're my mono green guru, all right? And I don't even have a mono green deck. I just like, you like green. green. <laughs> so I trust you. But um, you told me, you said, I don't remember the specific wording, but you said, if you want this deck to be a primal surge deck, it's going to be hard if you don't run combos. I can give you a couple combos if you want. And I said, no, mm-hmm. I don't want that because I don't want this to be like a combo deck. I want this to be like a pure mono green deck. And so I had to make that hard decision of like, do I completely change the concept that I was originally going for? Or do I kind of fall into sort of this area that I didn't want to do originally at all just to achieve this one cool card? It it just kind of felt weird for me. What's the what's the movie quote? I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the heart to do it. The strength. What is that from? Batman? uh, Tell us in the comments section. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Please tell me. But that's that's exactly like the internal dilemma that you're going through right now. It's like, yes. So I, I think after that, I said, if you don't want this to be a Primal Surge deck, I can tell you like 16 cuts that you can make right now, no questions asked, and you will be fine. Yeah. And and I, I don't know if I listed them out, nope. but I could have listed them out <laughs> then and there to you a T. You said, can you look at my Miram deck? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, I'll look change, at it change, change the subject. I need, I need to buy time to like actually put this list together. I was I, just trying to act cool in the moment. Yeah, cool the moment, but like, it it's just it it it's kind of like a weird thing, like especially when you know I I did the fail. By the way, don't do what I did. Don't buy cards before you play test. Try um, before you buy. Go go for a test drive. Moxfield has a play test function for a reason. Yeah, they always let you test drive the car before you buy it if you want. 
Yeah. And I didn't do that. So now I have to cut cards that I spent a little bit of money on. Granted, it's not too much, so it doesn't hurt. That that and you got good cards, so they'll find a home somewhere else. Exactly. They can just go into your cards you own deck. There you go, which I also am working on, although I don't think I need any cuts for that because that deck weirdly is good. (laughs) This gets into this idea that I like to call uh, pain points for a Mm -hmm. deck, like just feelings or thoughts that kind of just put a little thorn in your side or like give you like the bad brain tanglies, Mm -hmm. just things that provoke thoughts in deck building, editing decks. You're stalling up because you don't have enough draw or you don't have enough ramp because you put in a lot of eight drops and not a lot of ways to get to those eight drops. Yes. Um, You don't have enough removal. You struggle to actually close out the game, which I find is a very common thing with a lot of commander deck building trends is um, yeah, people build a deck and they like, they, they do stuff. They spin wheels but they don't actually have a way to win the game because of the common sentiment of, oh, the commander's not about winning. Well, it's still a game. Someone has to win eventually. I I have personally... You do need a win condition. You do, and I've fallen for that, that trap many a time on my deck building stream. I'll literally be at the very final, like, 100th card. We're good. And then one person will hop into chat, like, late, mid, late midstream, and they'll be like, so what is the? How does the deck win? And I'll I'll say that's a good question. Um, that's we'll not see. that's not how you want to answer that question. I know, and that's something that I've I've fallen into too. Is just because you get so caught up in the thing that you don't find ways to actually like take it a step further and win. Which is why I'm trying to experiment with Vivictus and Zapandrel and be more combat focused because that is how you win. Can I? Um, I don't want to. I don't want to rehash you know old drama or anything like that and by old drama i mean like from a minute and a half ago okay but um how does your primal surge deck actually win off primal surge um so it does because (laughs) so primal surge will win because i'll primal surge and then i'll get concordant crossroads out and then i'll swing what if you don't though what if it's already gone that what's your fail safe (laughs) eternal witness I feel like I have the lamp pointed at you right now. We're yeah, in the, inter- I we're in the interrogation thing of a, po- of a police precinct right now. Well, I don't run like, those, so it's fine. Where is he? Yeah. How do you how do you win the game? That is a- how how are you getting around all of these triggers? How are you not? It's it's not even how are you winning the game? How are you not losing the game? That's your the better Batman, question. Your Batman voice is unsettling. <laughs> and I've also- had a lot of practice. Okay, I don't. But like that, I mean, that's even another reason to to make cuts to your deck. It essentially, is just like maybe something is just very expensive, and you're like, God, I mm-hmm. I'd rather have a cheaper deck or a more budget friendly deck. I mean, Great Henge is what like guesstimating here off the top of my head, fifty dollars, fifty dollars, yeah, which is very expensive. But like fifty dollars can be two other cards in your deck, or it could be the cost of a deck. Let's be honest. I mean. It's there's a lot of different reasons to cut things. It just kind of depends on like your vibe and your your feel and your energy. But like yeah. pain points, I think is a good good area for that. I was having a conversation with someone yesterday because they were they're building a deck and you know the the deck that really inspired them was uh, three thousand dollars. How 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 do I do this when I, when it's three thousand dollars? And I was like, listen here, twenty four hundred dollars of that is seven cards. That's depressing. That deck is really like five to six hundred dollars. And then Gaudi, I just happen to have this sort of cards. And I think that's something that can inspire a lot of changes in a deck or just inspire mm-hmm. the deck building in the first place. It's just I have this card, I'm gonna run it, or I have this card and I feel guilty about it sitting in my box. So I'm gonna put it in a deck so that I can feel better about my decisions to have that card. I think I have two decks that were built off of that concept, which was number one, Sese. I had a bunch of secret layers rotting in a binder, and mm-hmm. I felt guilty about that. And gu- guaranteed, it's an expensive deck, but if you change it to its cheapest printings, the deck isn't that expensive if you yeah. like look at the original basis. Um, same thing with Vivictus. My Vivictus deck, if I did... Uh, accurate set printings would be expensive because I have like a that $90 brain dead diabolic tutor 
But Diabolic Tutor is a what, like a twenty-five cent card? If not that, even, it's not, not even, even worth the. It's not even worth the paper that is printed on in most there, cases. There you go. But like, you know, I I ran it in there simply because I wanted an excuse. Because Diabolic Tutor is a card that I find people say, "Well, is Diabolic Tutor a twenty twenty three card?" I've had people say that, but a lot of cards I run. But I'm like, well, I wanna, so I did. I think more often than not, I find myself making changes because I want to run a certain card more than I don't want to run another card. Uh, That's just like my personal experience. I think like best practice, it's Mm -hmm. the other way around. But I have a brand. I have a way that I like to enjoy the game. And I think like everyone has a brand. Everyone has a way that they like to enjoy the game. So editing towards that brand or editing towards you know, what's going to bring them the most amount of joy is, is frankly, at the end of the day, going to be the best decision to do. We, we don't have this written down, but I'm going to say it because I'm surprised we didn't. I'm surprised we didn't. What Marie you Condoing your deck. It's Marie Condoing your deck. That's, yeah. That is what it is. My You're brand. Marie, yeah. It's my you thing. Marie Kondo. You, you build what brings you joy. You cut what doesn't bring you joy. Is that something that may or may not be optimal? It depends on what that little Marie Kondo inside your chest is telling you. Mm-hmm. Now, she has gotten, she's like loosened up on her rules as time has gone on. Like ever since yes, the Netflix has. show, she is like really loosened up. But mm-hmm. I think everyone deserves to kind of loosen up a little bit at the end of the day too. Like you don't have to hold yourself to hard and fast rules. I feel like it's okay to challenge what other people might tell you to cut because yeah. i i like to ask people for opinions to cut he, example like i asked you about like my green deck i'm gonna tell you something completely different than what chris is gonna tell you to cut chris exactly. is gonna tell you something com- completely different than for like from what carson's gonna tell you to cut yeah Just- and there was in a good example for this is in my chandra my chandra deck there's a card i run called repeated reverberation and i've had back when i first was like you know conceptualizing this deck and i had this in my little pile of cards i was asking friends for an idea for it to cut he said cut this card i don't know why you run it and i said what do you mean and he goes repeated reverberation you're not doing spell singer and i said did you read the second half which says you copy that loyalty ability twice and so what is my main win con that I feel like if there's a card I feel like I'm known for, maybe I feel like it's repeated reverberation because I really hype that card up because it wins mm-hmm. me games. But that was the card. My win con was what people were telling me to cut, but I didn't yeah. cut it and I refused to because it's so good. <laughs> so in, in a general sense, um, yeah. what cards would you typically take out? to make changes and add new cards in. I have this like buzzword or buzz phrase that I use that mm-hmm. kind of just has a mm-hmm. different meaning to different people. I like to say that the first cards that you should cut to make changes are the cards where you trim fat, like you're trimming fat from the deck. You know, you're mm-hmm. gaudy, like this card only works if it has this card and this card and this card. Like the cards that need other cards to work for them to work themselves uh, is usually where I start. I don't know where, I don't know where, where, like, where do you start? So I kind of start in between that area and another, like it really depends on the deck. So most of the time I'll start at cards that I, that don't bring me joy, but I feel like I have to run quotes on half mm-hmm. to run because like, I want to be able to enjoy my deck. And if I'm playing a card I don't like, or I, I know this is going to sound weird, but there are cards that make me feel like icky in my chest. I don't know why I feel that way, but like it makes me go, I, just, I don't like it. It doesn't feel right to me. That'll be the card that I want to cut first because it's not fun for me. It may be the best choice, but it's not fun. And also trimming the fat. Like you said, um, I like to actually cut from like the, I guess you could call it the bottom of the deck, but like the highest mana value to kind of like lower my ACMC and make my deck a little bit quicker. I'm doing that in Zapandro right now. I mean, you saw it, but like cutting a lot of like the big things in order to round out your deck is also a good thing yeah. that I like to do. There, There's this general concept. I, I forget who ran the numbers like way back when. And I know things yeah. have changed a lot. Uh, or you could argue that things have changed a lot recently because mm-hmm. more people are running more ramp. And a lot of like the big haymaker, like heavy hitters in the format, mm-hmm. 
that like actually win you games are just more mana nowadays. But it, it was something like, on average, you're going to cast a card that's seven or more mana, like, once a game. Just in general. Like, you're going to cast a seven drop or more expensive once a game. And, like I said, I think that's changed a lot these days. Yeah. But if you think about if you think about the fact that, like, you might only be casting, like, one seven or, like, one eight drop a game. Do you need 13 in your deck? If you're playing a deck like yours, you know, big, mono, green, stompy, a lot of your deck is going to revolve around casting, a, you know, a couple of those. So that's the exception to the rule. I, I would, it's weird because I hear that rule and I think maybe two to three years ago that would have been the case. Yeah. I don't believe that's the case anymore now because I'm like, I don't I'm thinking about a lot of my decks. Um. But like, for instance, like Elminster, I feel like is a weird exception because he takes like yeah. an expropriate and makes it two mana. That's different. You're casting a nine drop, but you're not actually paying nine mana for it. There you go. But I feel like at the same time, a lot of people are able to cast their commanders pretty consistently, you know, especially with commander tax, you know, uh, mm -hmm. four mana becomes six, becomes eight, becomes 10 pretty consistently, I would say. So I, I really wouldn't yeah. say that. I, I think commanders have also just gotten cheaper over the years, too. <sighs> Ish, um, ish, but I, th I think we're seeing a, a, a turnaround on that a little bit. They're like they're printing bit. a lot of cards that say, "Hey, run an expensive commander like Majestic Genesis and Imposing Grander." Or Zupandril. He's he's seven mana. I run my true. I run my big boy. He's dummy thick, and I love him for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. But th this idea of trimming fat, where. In, in a traditional sense, like, you might only be casting a 7 or an 8 drop for full price, like, once a game. Where my fat trimming usually ends up being, it's that, like, 4 and 5 drop slot. Like, yeah, I, someone, I, I don't remember who, and they were like, 6 drops win games. 4 and 5 drops don't. So it's almost like you skip four and five on your curve D the difference between the impact of a five drop and the impact of a six drop these days is extreme and there's only one mana difference i actually find that really interesting that you say that i wouldn't i don't know if i would agree about the you know six drops win games thing i really don't think that i feel like that's kind of like a overarching sort of thing however mm -hmm. every time and i do mean every time when i deck build and i look at my curve my four is always the highest. I just find that really fascinating because it's, it's, but it's four very consistently for me. Yeah. And when I do cuts yeah. on my deck building stream, oftentimes when I find I'm having a very hard time to find cuts, like we feel like the deck is very finely tuned. My chat will ask me to separate cards by mana value. And then we go to the fours, which I find mm -hmm. really interesting. That's, you know, that's not to discredit the power of, of the four drop or anything like that. Like you kind of, you know, you got to play, you got to play a curve. Like you have to be able to play a card every turn. Yeah. If, agreed. You, if you can help it. Ideally. But if you're given the choice between two, four drops and an eight drop, I'm going to play the eight drop. If I'm given the choice between two, three drops and a six drop, I'm going to play the six. I guess it depends for me. For me, it depends because like, I don't know. I mean, there's the whole concept. I mean, we could go on for hours about this, talking we, about we like could, redundancy yeah. and, you know, like the, the magical Christmas land everything and stuff like, like that. that. Like, it really depends on the card for me, I would say. Because, like, mm -hmm. I have to I, – I weigh mana value and ability very strongly. Um Cause like, is, is, is the cost, you know, worth the payoff for me? And like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I think it depends, but I find yeah. it interesting. Um, There's a very clear pattern of where your deck gets concentrated in. And like you said, if there's just like a ridiculous extreme amount of four drops, you probably have too many there that's yeah. just getting too convoluted in your deck. So that's the easiest place to start with your, with your fat trimming. Um, mm -hmm. Other other like little things that I will look at is um, how much card draw I have versus how much ramp I have. Mm -hmm. I used to be someone who just run more ramp versus more card draw. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, well, if I already have 13, 14 mana, I don't need more ramp. And what mm -hmm. I need is cards in my hand 
to cast with that 13 or 14 mana that I already have. Yeah. So I've started to like ease back on the number of ramp pieces that I have in a deck and I'll add card draw instead mm-hmm. of that. So like I have a very direct edit that I can make mm-hmm. after the fact. Um, it works for me. Uh, granted, I play a lot of green, so it is easier for me to ramp uh, and ramp consistently. Yes, it is. Uh, if I'm playing, if I'm playing a color combination that maybe struggles a little bit more with like get ahead ramp, aka like I'm not playing a white deck or I'm not playing like an artifact blue deck, which I yeah. never would. <clears throat> but the need for the need for more ramp is actually there. So having like a more even number maybe maybe helps in that situation. But that ratio is something that I very directly take a look at and leads to a very direct like easy change and you can do that to ratchet up a deck doing mm. that can also ratchet down a deck as oh, well yeah. because you're technically a little bit slower off the ground with your curve mm. uh, which in in some cases like we like we mentioned is a good thing to be a little slower because maybe you wanted your deck to be a little bit more chill maybe you wanted the deck to just hang out a little bit more and kind of enjoy the scenery. And I know this is probably very, you know, understandable at this point, but I just want to emphasize it again. Slower does not mean you're not going to win. You know, I still want my opponents to be able to enjoy and play the game. I still want to win. I just, you know, don't want to like, you know, um, you know, body slam people turn three because that's not going to make people want to play with me again. That, um, that Miram deck that I've been building. (laughs) You need to burn that deck with fire. I cognizantly chose to make the deck a Karuga deck so that it would be like purposefully slower off the ground. Like it's instead of popping slower. instead of popping off on like turn three, turn four, it's like turn six, turn seven. But that like extra two turns makes all the difference at, at a table. And slowing your deck down by like a turn might might be all you need to like fit the vibe that you're, that you're trying to go for. I love you with my heart and my soul. That deck is not slow. <laughs> you showed me, you showed me that, that, that play test. You even texted me and you went, do you want to see something disgusting? And I said, yes. And you're like, look at this play test. And it was, it looked like you glitched out Moxfield. <laughs> Actual. Oh my God. That's so funny. <laughs> 24 niv mizzet Perunes, yes! 10 Ganex Astral Hunters, 100 Treasures, like... <laughs> so sorry. You're like, it's slower. It's it's still very scary. It, it was. <laughs> but to it be was. fair, you were playtesting by yourself, which can yeah. also be very different, especially when you're a pod playtesting. Playtest with people. That's actually, like, a very interesting thing to bring up. Um I would not make edits to a deck until you've played with actual people. Yes. There are like very, there are little things that you can do. There are little things Mm. that you can change when you're playtesting for yourself. When I, like when I playtest a deck, I don't playtest, like unless I'm like trying to like cognizantly learn lines, like unimpeded lines for a deck. I don't playtest past like turn three, turn four. Yeah. Yeah. Just because I want to see how I just want to see how the deck ramps out. I want to see how it develops like a little bit of card draw. That's it. Yeah. That's the only thing I really think that you can play test by yourself. Yeah. Um, so don't make edits until you've played. I like I'd say five or six games with yeah. actual people. I would I would also say like play testing by yourself or like well let, no, let's not even call it play test. Let's gold fishing. When you are gold fishing, um, y- you are going to get the ideal experience. Because mm-hmm. your opponents are going to be doing their own thing, i.e. not interacting with you. So, like, of course, you're going to pop off on turn four, or five, three, whatever yeah. have you. Um, but, like, you- I did that the other day with, like, Zapandrel. I was even texting you being like, oh, turn four is Zapandrel, turn three is Zapandrel. And it was really cool. But when I played it in person at my LGS, we were singing a little bit of a different tune. Mm-hmm. <laughs> little, little, little baby was a little slower, which is fine. But I learned. It's good. Performance anxiety. Jesus he was he was struggling he was struggling but like testing is I would agree with your concept on like testing and even then like there are going to be experiences that you get in one game where you're not going to get another which is why I'm glad you said do multiple games 
because um, I have a beautiful example of that actually on my stream. I put this card in my Zapandrel deck very randomly. I put an Impervious Great Worm, which is like what is like a 14 14 or like a 10 10 or something for like yeah, a with million convoke. mana. Yeah, with yeah. Convoke. Um, and I put that in there because I'm like big, dumb green creature. Live, laugh, love that for myself. Um, but when I was playing, I couldn't cast it, but I had a Garrick Collar of Beasts on the battlefield, and this was on stream. So I minus Garrick, put put that Great Worm on the battlefield, and I was like, wow, this is so sick and awesome. I'm glad I put this card in here. Hindsight bias. Exactly. Flash forward to FNM. I draw Impervious Great Worm. There's no Garrick. And I'm not a go wide deck. I am a go kind of, you know, dummy thick, a little bit tall, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so I was like, I don't have the mana to cast this. And it was a dead card in my hand. And I felt really bad. And like in that moment, if you've asked me, Chase, would you cut this card? I would have said no, because I got, I had Garrick to give me that cool thing. But without Garrick, this card is kind of like a, a, a little bit of a sad, sad moment for me. There's something interesting with testing a commander deck just in general. Mm -hmm. that's like if you change like two or three cards it's a hundred card singleton deck like you're not even guaranteed to see those cards you're not like you mm -hmm. might not see those cards for games and games and games and games if ever like yeah. that is technically statistically possible to never ever see the changes that you make yeah um so that's why i say like play multiple games like play five play ten games with mm -hmm. a deck before you decide to make changes and then play another five to ten games with those changes before you change again. Mm -hmm. So I guess the this kind of naturally segues into the into something that I'm incredibly passionate about in terms mm -hmm. of like editing, and that's over engineering changes. Because I'm certainly guilty of this all the time. I think everybody's guilty of over engineering their changes all the time. So this is just like the reality check mm -hmm. of deck editing for lack of a better term. And you brought up this concept of the ship of Theseus uh, yeah. before we started. So <laughs> I, I, wa I wanted to hear what you were what you were thinking here because I think it's totally true. It, it is. I, I like to use my sister deck as an example of this, but like the ship of Theseus is like, if you take it, if you take it apart and like you slowly replace, like repair, or replace it piece by piece, you know, and it, it gets put back together, is it still the same ship? If you just like take them, if essentially if you, you replace just, like, all replace the boards the on the ship, yeah, yeah, is, is it still the same ship? And you know, shout out WandaVision for giving me that dope reference. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, I would say yes and no, which is you know, I think I say often on here, like it's still going to be the same, like whatever commander deck, it's still going to be the same Locust Gods to say. Zapandrol, you know, Saskia, what have you. But like the concept of the deck is not going to be the same, especially if you kind of shift everything. Like if you ramp it up in power, if you lower it down in power too much, if you change the concept completely, it, it's going to be a different deck. And I feel like that depends on, on what you're going for personally. Cause like, if you want to change it, change it good for you and do that. But I don't think I've really done an over engineering to, to a certain extent like this. I, I, th I think it's interesting because, you know, you say that it, it's a different deck. I think as long as that like core concept, the thing that you, the, th the reason why you wanted to build that deck in the first place, I think if that's still intact, it's still the same deck. Um, whether it's changed power levels up, down, left, right, whatever, what have you. Like even even if you've changed the commander just mm -hmm. entirely, if it's still deep down sticking to the roots of why you wanted to build the deck in the first place, mm -hmm. I still think it's the same deck. That's it's just fair. the way that it, it's the way that it's presenting itself is different. Getting all philosophical here, bringing out. I don't have a philosophy my, degree, but we're bringing out a liberal you know? arts education. I have liberal arts education. Let's do Finally Socratic paying seminar, off. baby. Socratic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like, uh, um, I suppose it's a really fair way to put it. Like if I change my Locust God deck to like a Nekusar deck, like I'm still doing wheels, I suppose. Funny you bring up a Grixis commander. Last week we were talking about Bellacor versus like Rakdos uh, yeah. for demons. It's still a demon deck. It's just a demon deck with blue in it now. I do think that there is a line that you can cross 
where you change it too much, where it is no longer that same ship, where you have over-engineered changes Mm -hmm. so that the deck is irrecognizable, the deck is not what you were going for, or the changes change the vibe completely. If I wanted to ratchet up a deck a little bit, add in my worldly tutor, add in my, you know, Salvala combo, what have you. Mm. If I add those in and they take it too far, well, I've technically over-engineered my changes. You know, same thing going the other way, removing that kind of stuff, and then it's not powerful enough to play at the tables mm-hmm. that I wanted to play at. You know, it it is it is possible to to do stuff like that. But I also think just like over like over-engineering a change is just blanketly it's a change it's too much change in a direction that you didn't want to go in. Um, or it's overcorrecting a problem. If if I may, I think I think this might kind of, kind of connect to it because like you've talked to me before about doing this, and I had asked you about doing this, and you told me you think I couldn't handle it, which I agree. Um, but you said that you know there was a moment where you were having experience where you feel like you kind of changed things too much with one of your decks. I don't remember which deck it was, um, but you told me most of that them. you were just. Yeah, you so you you told me there was like a, I think a solid week period where you were like I'm taking everything apart and I'm starting from scratch and that's what you Burn did. It down. You did. You you yeah. literally and I was like, "Ooh, should I do it?" and you were literally like, "Dude, I don't know if you could do this." <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know I don't know if you can handle the emotional weight of um no. burning down all of your babies. <laughs> no, I don't think I could. But I'm I think that was a very good way for you to handle that because you're still able to restart fresh. And kind of, kind of come back to your, um, your starting concept and, and your starting vibe with the deck yeah. that you wanted, and just, just from scratch, I think is a good way to do that. I've been, I've been doing it for a very, very long time, like ever since I started playing Commander. But um, I, I think this concept of burning it all down, um, as a way to um, just either a start fresh, but b have a reality check on over-engineering your problems was really mm-hmm. popularized by Dan, uh, Dan Sheehan. Yes, it was. Yeah, I remember you um, texted me that tweet that Dan uh, posted and you're like, I think I'm going to do this. And I was like, good luck. <laughs> I, I do it around then anyways, but I think Dan just like got that fire going in me a little bit more vigorously than usual, mm-hmm. which just another reason why I love Dan. Like Dan's an amazing person. Mm-hmm. But I, like, it is it is a very good thing, and a lot of times you don't know if you're over engineering a problem until it's too late. An example that I will I will give uh, my primal search deck. I know yes. you were, I know you're trying to like work away from this, but this actually hammers home the concept of um, you not wanting to do a co- like combo primal search, mm-hmm. um, and this is part of why a big part of my primal search deck was I had I had problems protecting it i had problems protecting my wins Mm -hmm. um so what do you do when you can't run heroic intervention you put in everything that says your opponents can't do stuff you know you Mm. go out of your way to add the dromokas you go out of your way to add the morale you go out of your way to add the linvala the like everything like that the your gerard glorious protector just all of those cards that say you can't do anything or if you try to do something nothing happens to me Mm mm-hmm well, 13 cards later, I'm, I'm playing and I was like, I can't do anything. <laughs> like, why well, Like, why am I going to play a Glorious Protector into just like this regular board? This isn't doing anything for me. So like, I went 10 cards too deep. Like, I said, yeah. this, is a, this is a big problem. But I mm-hmm. overestimated how big of a problem it actually was. In yeah. reality... Like when you have Birthing Pod, when you have Yisan and stuff like that, you only need like two cards because you're always going to be able to find them. It, like if your game is going even remotely okay. Yeah. I think it's a lot different when you don't have tutors.deck. But even then, like it's okay for things to go wrong. It's okay for your board to get wiped. Like you don't need nothing to ever happen to you at all times. Yeah. You don't want to play solitaire, essentially. Yeah. And that's kind of what basically. you were doing. Well, I, I think you were just kind of catastrophizing a little bit because you wanted to protect your deck so much that you were like, okay, it's time to prepare for every single scenario. But if you prepare for every single scenario, then you lose the original concept of your deck because you have to make room 
for all of that preparation and suddenly you're running 30% less of what you wanted to do. Once I did dial it back beyond that, like I love the deck. I, it is actually one of the few decks that I think is done. Um, there's very little that will, will or could go in there th- that improves it's done it. It's for now. There's more to just editing a deck when you like fall out of love with it, when you find a problem with it. It's, you know, this idea of editing a deck when there's new cards that are printed. Like, how often do you go and edit a deck that, you know, you see new cards printed for? And I know we, like, kind of touched on this at the beginning of the show, but I think it's a good thing to end on. Mm-hmm. Because I, there are people out there who edit every single deck every single time a new set comes out. And I don't – I'm not one of those people. I'm not either. I I don't I don't I don't tend to do that. I cuz here's the deal, the perfect card could be released. Let's say in March of the machines, there's a perfect card released for Locust God. If I don't like it as much as the other cards in Locust God, I don't care how good it is. I'm not going to run it. I only want to run things that I like. So mm-hmm. I I will edit a deck if there's something I like more that is previewed or maybe I discover an old card that I didn't know existed that combos with a new card that I like more. Then I'll run it. But that's kind of how I do it. You know, it's this this concept of like the time capsule of a deck. Uh, if I see a new card that I just like really, really, really enjoy, really vibe mm-hmm. with, um, chances are, uh, as opposed to putting it into an old deck of mine, and I know this, like this comes from a place of privilege. Uh, I'm just probably going to build a new deck with that new card, and then if I really, 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 really like it in that deck. Mm-hmm. I'll go back and I'll add it to the old deck. Uh, I'm kind of going through that right now with um, Gwenna from Brothers War. They're oh, yeah. this th- like three mana mana dork uh, that you can only use for creature and like creature abilities. Like, it's the perfect oh, primal search card. That's a great card. I know what card you're talking about. Yeah, but I don't know what I would cut for it. So I'm just not going to deal with it. And I'm going to mm-hmm. move on with my life as if nothing's happening. <laughs> But I like I'm building some other decks, and I, I've put Gwenna in in those decks. Yeah, and then just, if I really, really like Gwenna in those decks, then I'm gonna find, then I'm gonna sit down and spend the hour and a half finding one cut for them in in Prime yeah. Surge. It's not the end of the world if you can't find space for a card. You know, you have plenty of time to edit your decks and change your decks, and maybe yeah. it just they're not going anywhere. Like you, Exactly. Or maybe, like you said, maybe it has a home in a different deck or maybe it has a home being its own commander. You never know until you test it out and try it. Um, I think that's kind of like a, a, a good way to look at it. You know, like yeah. don't, don't feel, don't pressure yourself to achieve this kind of like goal post that you've set out for yourself. You're fine. Take your time. Don't, don't, don't stress about it. Cutting cards is supposed to be fun. I heard. <laughs> I, it's fun after the fact. It's not fun there we in go. the moment. <laughs> yes, it which is, is not. why I just don't do it. Uh, I, I think it's really, really interesting. Um, shoot, I was talking to Jim uh, mm. probably like a month, m- month and a half ago. Jim yeah. built this Council of Four deck, and he's just like, "Yeah, I had 105 cards. I couldn't figure out what to cut, so I'm just running 105 cards." I love that for him. <laughs> I was like, "Ah, oh, the." Cool. Uh, the good old dragon shield special yep because they always come with a couple extra sleeves in the package and you just sleeve everything up and you're just like mm-hmm. yeah basically i love like, that nothing's stopping you from doing that like nope I, I would probably bring it up at the beginning of the game like hey like i got a couple extra cards in here i'm just trying to figure out like what to run um mm-hmm. this is the this is the list these are the cards that i'm like keeping an eye on you just bring it up with your play group like hey can you help me figure out like what you like in this deck out of this list of cards if it comes up? That yeah. way you have like a little bit more brain power going into your changes. But, like run those 105 cards. Run that run the Dragon Shield special. Or your your 102. I love Just, that. That's great. No, nothing's stopping you. Yeah. It also it makes that's... editing your decks easier. <laughs> Truly, yeah, it does actually. Um I like. I'm gonna actually start doing that. Actually, I find myself ha- having difficulties cutting cards. I should just do that. That's cool. I dig Br- it. I'd say something, obviously, but oh, like, yeah, of course, just do it. Like, yeah, it's I'm illegal. not gonna stop you. It's recommended. You know, 99 with a commander is 100. It's recommended. Yeah. We're we're playing a loose commander like structure. Obviously, like I would 
like end up cutting those cards eventually. Like don't don't run the Dragon Shield special constantly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um if you like if you're still just like trying to figure out some edits, trying to figure out some tasks, everything like that, just do it. Um, yeah. I think it's completely fine. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of Bad at Magic. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chase, also known as Mana Curves. I'm a commander content creator, streaming paper commander, and deck building on my Twitch channel, Mana Curves. And you can also find me writing articles about commander for Star City Games. And I'm at EK Plays Cards on all of the things. I work behind the scenes with most of your favorite content creators. So if you're supporting them, you're also supporting me. You can support this podcast by leaving a like, leaving a comment, all that kind of stuff, like a review if you're listening to the audio version of this podcast. But did you know that there's a YouTube version of this podcast too? So subscribe to the YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff. Feed the algorithm, give us those good brain chemicals because it really does help out the show. And we will see you next week.